Take you on as far as that issue, the Supreme Court dismissing the application uh, of Roxanne Nelson Dafia McCoy in respect of the president's appointees coming before parliament. We'll actually bring you some footage on that and have a discussion on saying. Up next on the AM show. The five member panel of the Supreme Court was presided over by the Chief Justice herself, Gertrude Isaba Tokuno. The other members of the panel were Justice Kinsley Kumsin. Justice Maria Mawusu, Justice Amadou Tanko, and Justice Yao Dakun Asari. The court described the application filed by the NDC MP as frivolous and, a, and an abuse of the court process. After this judgment of the Supreme Court had been handed down, the Attorney General, Godfrey Yabo Adami, said he was excited about what had happened and that, in fact, he did not agree with members of the public who sought to suggest that the Supreme Court were handling this case specially and not paying much attention to the case involving the anti-LGBTQ injunction application filed by lawyer and journalist Richard Delaskai. The application clearly was, was frivolous and there ought not to be any um, manipulation of what went on in court. Even Parliament itself was opposed to the application. On, on the cases that are being heard, there are those who have taken the view that some cases were filed two weeks prior to this case being filed and the Supreme Court has proceeded to deal with it. The Chief Justice himself has raised issues about persons not prosecuting their own cases. Well, what do you make of it? Yes, I mean, as I said, it's most unfortunate that persons will file a, a processes before the court and then uh, fail to take an interest in it. On record um, in Parliament, it's, it's a letter that I wrote to a speaker asking him to reconsider his decision and all. So I expect Parliament, after having come to the Supreme Court, to oppose this application to also um, reconvene and, and deal with the, the matter related to the approval of the, of the ministers. I asked the Attorney General specifically, if he's interested in getting that injunction that has been filed to stay the hands of President Ekufuado on the anti-LGBTQ bill and whether or not he'll be filing for the Supreme Court to actually deal with the matter expeditiously. He said that he does not intend to prosecute the case for the, the, the person who had filed this case in, in, the, in, this, in this suit, Richard Delasca. Is the position that if Richard Sky does not prosecute this case, the Supreme Court is not going to hear it, and the, 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 the hand of the president is going to be stayed on this bill up until Richard Sky decides that he takes an, he takes an interest in this matter. Well, if, if Richard Sky does not prosecute the matter, the application will, will be dismissed. Then the process he has filed in court will be dismissed. Yeah, yes, but so, said, and, but, hold on, hold on. I think that the duty to fix the date for hearing rests in the registry of the, of the Supreme Court. And I do not understand where this business of people actually um, scrutinizing when applications are faced for hearing or why these applications are for hearing even came from. Back in the days, if we file an application in the Supreme Court of Ghana, it takes even three months for you to have a date for hearing. It is only after a party has made an application for an expeditious determination of the, of the process that the matter will come up for hearing. And indeed, in, in the record, we show that this particular case, for the record, it must be indicated that the I specifically applied for an expeditious determination of the, of the matter. I applied for it expired hearing of the application. So it is not the Supreme Court of Ghana uh, picking and choosing which applications to hear and not to, not to hear. Any party to any matter, back in the days I used to do it even when I was in opposition. You that, file for an expedited hearing I, in the I, sky case. I, I, so I, I think you should ask the plaintiff. Well, the plaintiff is the one who instead the action. The plaintiff is the one who instead the action and the plaintiff ought to um, bear the responsibility for, 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 for the conduct of the, of the matter. I'm not going to conduct the case for a plaintiff. Another big issue in court today had to do with the appearance of the NDC MP and his lawyers. Neither the MP nor his lawyers were in court today. There was no explanation as to why they were not in court. But the bailiff of the Supreme Court was put under oath and he gave some facts to the Supreme Court. He said he went to the law firm of the lawyer for Roxanne Nelson, the firm of court. That's it. that is Nick Paco Samuaro, to serve on him some court documents including the hearing notice for today. And that when he did in fact go to the law firm to serve these documents on him, he did not meet the lawyer himself. He met one person called Na, who told the bailiff that lawyer Nikapo Samuado had categorically instructed her not to receive any application, any court processes, any document from any person whatsoever. And that he did indeed proceed to lay the documents on the table, which would have meant that the documents have now been truly served. The Attorney General had been pressing for the, 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 the lawyer to be referred for disciplinary proceedings 
and that he described that as a, the highest form of disrespect that any person can do to the Supreme Court for lawyer who has filed an application in the matter to direct a rejection of the affidavit of position that has been filed by the other side. I mean, it's, it's really, for me, gross professional misconduct. Be that as it may, uh, the court proceeded to deal with the matter, and, and, and that is it. Um, I think that was very unfortunate, especially as the same counsel was in the same day filing processes in the Supreme Court of Ghana. Earlier in the morning, he was rejecting processes from the Supreme Court of Ghana, and then in the afternoon, he proceeded to file uh, processes in the same Supreme Court of Ghana. And I think the processes of the highest court of the Republic ought to be respected. The dignity and authority of the court always ought to be protected and respected by all counsel, and that is the point I sought to make in court. But the court, led by the Chief Justice, said they will take some action on that at a later date. Reporting for Joy News, Kweku Asante, the Supreme Court, Accra. Welcome back on uh, the AM show. Now we continue from there with that footage and yesterday the Supreme Court ruling on uh, the matter, the application filed by South Nile legislator Roxanne Nelson de Afyemekpo uh, being deemed frivolous. Also in the words of the Attorney General Godfrey Yabwadame. But how does the, the applicant, the person who filed this suit, feel about that situation? We're going to have a conversation with two lawyers. One, the very person who went to the Supreme Court with uh, this matter, Roxanne Nelson, Dafia McCall, the South Dai legislator. And on the other hand, we'll have uh, Kweku Painto, also a lawyer on uh, this uh, matter. Mr. Painto, a very good morning to you. Thank you for joining the conversation. Hello, Kweku Painto. Do we have Mr. Painto on the line? Yes, hello, I'm here, I'm on the line. Okay, I can hear you now. Can I, couldn't, you? I couldn't hear you initially. Thank you. Right. You're uh, welcome. Looking, looking at the processes so far and everything that has happened, culminating in the different votes, I believe five to two and three to four, on different questions posed by uh, the applicant to the Supreme Court, what do you make of, of what has happened as far as the court's ruling is concerned? You are talking about what transpired yesterday? Yes. Yeah, I think the Supreme Court has thrown out their application for injunction, meaning that the substantive matter will stay. The substantive matter that they want the court to determine with regard to the power of parliament to proceed with the, what do you call it, the determination of the capacity or otherwise of the people that the president has nominated for the different ministerial positions that will stay but if you i mean i mean and i think it's the right thing that the supreme court did because see an application for injunction is what we call an equitable relief an equitable relief essentially looks at what would the parties i mean i mean we have moved from law to equity what right. it means is that if you come to the court and you are seeking an equitable relief, you are essentially trying to demonstrate that if nothing is done about staying proceedings or staying matters, I mean, the way they are proceeding, by the end of the proceedings, I'm talking about the substantive matter, you will have lost something which we call ir 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 irredeemable. In other words, you, you, it cannot be redeemed in any way. But it does not... This particular case does not appear to fit into that category at all. My understanding, if I'm right, is that the applicant is trying to restrain the court from, I mean, I'm talking about the application for injunction. I mean, the application for injunction that parliament must not sit over the matter. But the point of the matter is that if the court has to weigh the issues, if parliament proceeds to hear the, uh, uh, what do you call, do the sittings and they pass these people and become parliament, uh, they become ministers of state. 
And eventually, the court were to make a determination that these people were not qualified. The real question is, what would we have lost as a country or as Ghanaians? I'm talking about the equitable, I mean, the equity involved in this matter. Alternatively, if the court were to restrain them, Please, we are talking about governance. We are talking about running a country. We're talking about people filling positions and um, was to end. And by the time that it ends, the court comes to the conclusion that the decision that the president took to appoint these ministers in accordance with the procedural rules was correct. How are you going to compensate Ghana as a country for the time loss for the failure of these proposed ministers to act in those positions? And that is how I, the Supreme Court came to the conclusion, even though I've not seen the full copy of their ruling. But I believe that that is why the Supreme Court came to the conclusion that the application was frivolous. It's not every matter which is pending before a court of law that the court ought to restrain a party or I mean, a, a party from doing the proposed act. It cannot be. So I wholly agree with it. Hello, uh, Mr. Painto. Mr. Painto, uh, we cannot hear you unless maybe, I don't know whether you've <laughs> Press the, the mute button. Can you hear me now? Right. It could be a network connectivity <laughs> issue. Mr. Painter, if you can hear me, just go back about 30 seconds. We lost you. Well, uh, we'll try to get Mr. Painter uh, back. We'll also try to get Roxanne Nelson, Dafia uh, who is the one who's been in court. Uh, Roxanne, can you hear me? Yes, uh, Ben, I can hear you. Good morning to your viewers, and um, it's, it's a privilege to have joined you this morning. How do you feel, or how did you feel yesterday when the courts literally threw out your applications uh, before it? Uh, how did it make you feel? Well, the, 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 I, I'm, I'm indifferent. These are constitutional matters, so there's nothing like uh, a loss or a win. Um, so... Um, to that extent, um, I'm all right. But I'm worried about the procedure adopted. The procedure adopted with all due respect to the court, I think, was um, um, uh, I have a problem with it. Let's look at why? that procedure. Let's, let's quickly look at those procedures you speak yes, of and why you have a problem with it. Now, a party applies ex parte to the court mm -hmm. for expeditious hearing. Who is this party? The Attorney General. The Attorney General has publicly stated that he applied ex parte to the court without recourse to me, nor my lawyer, nor the other, nor the first defendant in the matter. Mm. Now, the mm -hmm. court proceeds to act on that ex parte application. Then the court decides to, to now serve the process. If you attempt to serve my lawyer and you fail, you have to serve me the party. I'm the one you are supposed to serve. You say they attempted to serve and failed. They, the bailiff went, I'm sure you follow. The bailiff no, no, says he on, went. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on since on, you, you on, brought ben, it up. Ben, the bailiff ben, went ben, to ben, the, ben, the firm ben, and, ben, and, ben, and ben, was told... Roxanne, let's have a conversation. Ben. You've brought a point. I'm trying to lay the foundation. You can respond to it. Ben, he went to the firm. Is, is the receptionist purportedly told him that he could not, that she had been directed not to allow any, you know, filing of this. And he left it on the desk. He left it on the table, which the court considers to be duly serving the party involved. Is that not what we know? Yes, that is all you know, but that is false. You're saying it is false. I'm saying you, 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 you laid a very prolonged foundation. So let me address the matter. No, be, before you do, so you mean the bailiff lied? The bailiff lied. Well, you think bailiffs don't lie? He lied. Even before the court, the bailiff lied. The bailiff went to tell the court that somebody told him that he, he has been instructed not to receive court process. 
and the name of the person the village gave to the court is Na. Do you know how many Na's we can find in the, in the gun state? Is there a Na at the office at, at that firm? I don't know. I don't work there. I don't know. That is my lawyer's office, but I have no idea whether a certain Na works there. But if a certain Na works there, is that, is that how the village should communicate the identity of a person who receives a process in the court firm? The court itself has laid down procedure in service. And, you have to, and, and the procedure is that if a party's lawyer cannot be served, you serve the party himself. So I won't belabor this point because the, 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 the deficiencies have been exposed yesterday. It was exposed. Now, uh, uh, just, just before you go on, I, I always like to... So you're basically saying, and mind you, the bailiff was brought, he swore. You know how it is done in court. The chief justice herself was there. You are basically suggesting the bailiff lied under oath. That is the point I'm making. Okay. That is the point I'm making. That is the point. To the extent that the attorney general will actually move the court that disciplinary proceedings be brought against the lawyer, even without hearing the lawyer. Is that how things, things are done in our, in our judicial system? That after hearing one party, you proceed to, to draw conclusions? Is that how things are done? So this matter, me, I am so happy about actually what happened yesterday. Because it exposed the inefficiencies in our judicial administration. Because... What, what in, my, in my humble view, the court ought to have done, because there was no urgency about the matter, was to have directed that, make sure the parties are properly served. If you can't serve the lawyers, that's fine. But ensure that you serve the parties properly, so that we could return to court next week. But it didn't happen. The court proceeded and, and, and said, what is frivolous about my application? And let me ask, it appears that a lot of people don't appreciate the point, the, the constitutional point I am raising. And let me restate it. I am saying that the president woke up on the 14th of February this year and publicly said that he had dismissed some number of ministers. I didn't, I didn't issue that communication for the president. It came from the president. He said he was dismissing this number of ministers with immediate effect. I didn't use those phrases. He, he used those phrases. And that he was, he, was, he was thanking them for offering public service. And that he wished them well in their future endeavors. The president proceeded to give the names of the ministers he has dismissed from office. Then he, then he went further to name some, minutes, some persons that he, he wants to nominate as, for purposes of parliamentary approval, for purposes of appointment as ministers of state. Then after that communication, the minister says that, the, the president says that some ministers that he has just dismissed from office, he has reassigned them. And nobody thinks that there's something constitutionally improper about this. Based on the authority in J.H. Mensa versus the Attorney General. Mm. I am not saying that the president hasn't got power to appoint people into office. That's not what I'm saying. I am saying the procedure for doing so is that if you want to reshuffle ministers, reshuffle them. Don't dismiss them from office before you reshuffle. So if you tell me that you have dismissed somebody from office, the person is no longer occupying that office based upon which he can be resuffled. This is the technical point I am making. Right. And, and that brings me so, to, so, to... So hold on. Then the president proceeded. So I raised the matter, if you recall, on your channel on, on the evening of that Valentine's Day, I raised the matter and I cautioned them that if they don't correct the communication, I will sue. I said so. It was even that interviewed me and one other person and forgot it. So after one month, I asked him the matter. 
The president proceeded to communicate with parliament. What did he do? He sent names of persons he has nominated for purposes of ministry appointment to parliament for purposes of um, 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 the satisfying the requirement in Article 78 and 79 of the Constitution. In addition to that communication, the president now sends the names of ministers of state that he has dismissed and, and informing parliament that he has reassigned them to other ministerial portfolios. This is the government of my, 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 my complaint before the court. So I am saying that the president intends to sidestep the parliamentary pre approval requirement. You, you can appoint people into ministerial portfolio by all means as the president. But the requirement under Article 78 and 79, which says that such appointments must be subjected to pro parliamentary approval, is what I am demanding that it be given effect to. So I am right in asking parliament not to proceed with the other, other vetting process of the other ministers until the entire government of list is, is complied with. So do you appreciate what I'm saying? I get what you're saying, but at least so on the, the second so, point where the ruling so, was three so, to four so, so, on the new nominees, right? At, at least that, 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 was, that was a point made by the Supreme Court, right? Sorry? I'm saying on the second point, there are those who were already ministers, right? Who were just moving, yeah. switching portfolios. And yeah. there were those who were now coming in, whether as ministers or deputies. There was a ruling on, on, on that as well. How, how do you react to that? Okay, here is, here is the point. The president did not separate the communication to parliament. Mm. It was one act. So it is that business that I am seeking to injunct. It is one single presidential act, one communication. You cannot decouple that from the other. Okay. All right. Uh, hold because, for me, Roxon. So, uh, so my point is that now those ministers who supposedly have been reassigned, even though they've been dismissed from office, we have been told that they can go on and continue to carry themselves out as those ministers until the matter is determined on its merit. If the matter is determined that they ought to have received pre parliamentary approval, the damage that would have been caused, how, how is that repaired? So on the balance of the probabilities, I think that the court ought to have been, been more fair with me and said that, well, we could, we could direct that, we could direct that the six being injuncted from carrying out themselves as ministers of state until the matter is determined on its merit. But the, the freshly nominated names, parliament could proceed to deal with them. It would have been a fair determination in my opinion. But that didn't happen. So uh, here we are, my brother. Hold for me. Let me bring in Kweku Painto. Kweku, you were making a point and then we lost you briefly on that point so we can move forward. Yes. I mean, I haven't heard my learned friend. I fundamentally disagree with him on both points. The first place, the issue of service, the rule of practice is that is the lawyer with the conduct of the case who ought to be served. And he served in his registered chambers. And it is whether he's present or absent, a process could be left. So it's not a question of meeting the lawyer's absence and stuff like that. We run law chambers with personnel. And it's not about the physical presence of the lawyer in chambers. And even though there might be an obligation to serve the party directly in peculiar circumstances, there was no need whatsoever for that to be done. And if the bailiff left the process there, whether with or without an incident, that was proper service. And it is not open to the lawyer or his client to come to the court to plead that they were not aware. I mean, that cannot ever be the case. So I disagree fundamentally with my learned friend as to the mode of proceeding for service on him when his lawyer's office was open for business. That is the first point. The second point is about the question of determining the interlocutory matter. 
I fundamentally disagree with him. We are talking about people who are going to serve public office. And if the contention that they are not fit or whatever, even if it is held at the end of the substantive matter, what would Ghana have lost? That's the real question for him to answer. Ghana, what would Ghana have lost if we get somebody to occupy an office for which he's not qualified, as you claim? But look at the inverse. Look at the, I mean, the inverse of the situation. If at the end of the proceeding, the Supreme Court throws out your case, then Ghana would have been without a minister or nobody would have filled up portfolio. And I mean, what, what happens? How, how do we even assess the consequence? I mean, in terms of, I mean, our national programs and stuff like that. So on both counts, if he has a case in the Supreme Court, at the right time, the Supreme Court will make a determination. The issue we are dealing with is what the country as a whole must in the interim do. The Supreme Court has said, and I agree with the Supreme Court, that an application that seeks to stop a minister from performing the duties or functions of an office on the basis of an allegation that the procedure for nominating him is faulty is, is, is not one that the Supreme Court ought to rely upon as a basis for injuncting that nominee or however from operating or from running in the office until the determination of the case. I notice that my learned friend has not be able to state what the country will lose if at the end of the day, these people have acted in the office and it is determined that they acted wrongly. What practical thing will we have lost? So that's the way it goes. Even on a parallel reasoning, even our Supreme Court has ruled that even in chief tenancy matters, if a chief is taken to court on, a, on the basis of the allegation that he is not fit and whatever, that cannot form a basis for restraining him from performing the office. And that if he performs in that office and at the end of it, the matter is determined against him, everything that he did whilst performing the duties of a chief, even if it was illegally in occupation, would be valid. These are fundamental principles that we can apply. I mean, with the Supreme Court determined. And we are talking about a serious institution like, I mean, ministerial position, whatever, in the governance of this country. And all your cases that you, they, they, they ought not to be. Fair enough. You may win at the end of the day. But the question that I'm asking my learned friend to tell the, his, the audience is what would the country have lost? even if the court came to a conclusion that they were not entitled to occupy the office. That is the question on the floor. Hold, hold on and for me, Kweku. I do not know whether... Uh, I do know that sometimes you would look at the consequences, what the, the other person or the other party will suffer. But whether it is limited yes. to purely what you're saying is another point. But I'll leave uh, Roxanne Nelson, Dafia Makbo, to respond to that. What is your response to Kweku Pencil? Now, <laughs> my senior Kweku Pencil, I... <laughs> Is, is, is saying that today uh, personal service on a party is not fundamental to a court process. Is that what he's saying? Is, I'm is, saying is that. that I'm saying that. Wait, 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 wait. I want him to make his point and then you'll come in. Go and read, Kwe Kwe, please hold read, for me. You should go and read Barclays Bank versus Veta Cable. You should go and read that case. You should go and Supreme Court decision. You should go and read it. So, so I'll leave the issue of service. Today, if dumping a process in the premises of a lawyer, not even the lawyer, in the premises of a lawyer, not even a party, is good service, it's fine. I mean, when the Supreme Court makes a determination on a matter of procedure, it becomes law. So that is fine. Until another decision erupts, that becomes a procedure. So it's fine. The second point that Kweku is asking me that I should, I should, I should, I should show what 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 damage what damage will be caused if we have people acting in ministerial portfolios who ought not to have been there you should go and read the new the new contract amendment act where we have determined the people who have the capacity to enter into contract on behalf of the state and see whether if you are not qualified to be a minister of state and yet you are permitted to act in that capacity and you enter into contract, the consequences for the republic and the state. So you should not be making this pedestrian and whimsical argument. Uh, Roxanne, this, this Roxanne. Are very, these, are very weight, these are very weighty matters. He has not been Roxanne, able to... I, 
I beg I, of you, using the term pedestrian has a certain very connotation. Very well, I withdraw, withdraw, I, I, withdraw. But okay. I withdrawn. But I'm saying that these are very witty constitutional law matters. Because the requirement for pure parliamentary approval is so important that it cannot be sidestepped by a certain communication from the office of the president, if that is what they are suggesting. It cannot, as a member of parliament, I will not allow that requirement to be glossed over under any circumstance. Because, you see, in constitutional law governance, there's nothing like miscommunication. When you take a decision, the decision is taken. So when the constitution is breached, it is breached. It has to be remedied. I have two quick questions for you before I come to Kweku for a response. Why the double application, the first on the 21st and the second on the 25th? The court found that duplicitous, a mere replication, when in fact it was the first application uh, the court was being told uh, to rely on as far as the speaker's determination was concerned. That is question number one. And question number two, why is it that you send this case to the Supreme Court and yet on D-Day, which was yesterday, you were nowhere to be found. And your lawyer, uh, Mr. Somado, was also nowhere to be found. You couldn't be found in court. Why? Now, let me, let me kill this district. You may be in court, but if you don't receive a hearing notice served on you, how do you go to court? Has the Supreme Court determined that I was served as a party and I refuse to appear? If there's anybody... Who is, who, is, who, is, who, is, who is a court animal in this country? It is me. I go to court regularly. Because that is where I think that I can adjudicate my grievances. So the suggestion that I came to court, and yet when, they, when it, was, it was time for the matter to be heard, I didn't show up. It's purely political. But when it was time for service, I mean, you were served and you didn't show up. Uh, ben, what they are saying. Are you, ben, are you listening to me? I am. Has the court made the effort to serve me who came to court? No. Your lawyer was so, served. Can you, can you let me finish? So the option open to the court was to serve my lawyer. Now, a certain belief claims that he, he didn't find my lawyer, but he went to my lawyer's premises, his law firm, the premises of the law firm, and saw a certain now. And I'm saying that is not how court, court processes are served regularly. But if the court makes the determination that, you see, the essence of service is to notify you to appear. So if the form of the notification is in itself regular, you cannot be in court. What are the circumstances surrounding this matter? I file an application on notice to the defendant that I, I intend to seek an interlocutory order from the court. Now, the Attorney General claims that he has been served. And without entering appearance, he now files what we call affidavit in opposition. And then right, he claims that he wrote to the court for expeditious re-hearing without copying me, without copying the other defendant. The court acted on this expeditiously and issued hearing notice and actually varied its court the course list for the following day. All this happened the night before or the day before the hearing date. And people are all over the place saying that they asked me to come to court and I didn't appear. Look, so, so I don't let us. So, so do you feel you have been, you've been treated unfairly in, in this entire process? In any, case, in any case, let me put this on record. I am happy that Attorney General publicly stated that he, he applied for expeditious hearing of this matter. And, and, and let me add that expeditious hearing of the matter is not only limited to the application, the injunction application. It's actually, it, it, it actually involves the entire case. So I am looking forward that this matter will be listed quickly for his hearing. I mean the substantive matter before the court. When you say substantive matter, which one are you, are you referencing? That is the RIT. The RIT, okay, the right. RIT based upon which I brought the application. Th there was also so this question about... is asked for expeditious area of the matter. It's not limited to only the, the, the injunction application. It's actually in respect of the entire matter. Right. There's also and, this and question... 
Roxanne, and I'm hoping that we, we have limited only... time, so let's make the most of the time left. Uh, there's also this question about uh, claims that, listen, Richard Delasca's issue was there, and the court hasn't fast-tracked that enough, but this issue has been heard. And, and there are some disagreements there. What exactly is the disagreement? Disagreement in respect to what? The Richard Delasky uh, suit, which, of course, your end, the minority was hoping would be dealt with uh, speedily in, in respect of uh, the bill. And your case uh, has been heard ahead of that. Some feel something doesn't add up and that that other issue should have been given a uh, prime of place me, as well. Let me, let me, let me offer this. My, I, I think the position of the minority and the NDC is that there appears to be abuse of the use, uh, abuse of discretion. Come, come. That's, That's all they are saying. That there's no fairness in the exercise of discretion because in exercise of discretionary power, you're supposed to be fair and not whimsical. If matters come before the court, and they come in a certain sequence in terms of date. And they touch on similar things. Because the injunction application in respect of which is Kai and, and, and Amanda Audrey, I think so, is actually directed at Parliament. All right? Not to remit a certain deal passed by Parliament to the office of the president. That they are actually injuncting that act, that function to be performed by Parliament. So it's also it also borders on the exercise of a constitutional mandate. Okay. And that that has been pending for a couple of weeks now. All right. And my first application is also to injunct Parliament from proceeding with a certain performance of or function under the constitution. But mine has been prioritized ahead of that. The people have a right to 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 have to express their misgivings about that. It's not up for me to say. I leave that for uh, for the judgment of the ordinary people. All right, thank you, Roxanne. Um, um, I'll come back to you for your 20 or 30 second take. Uh, Kweku, I know you have a lot to say. You have one and a half minutes to say it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say that I believe the Supreme Court was very right in reaching the conclusion that it reached yesterday on the interlocutory application that was before it. And what it means is that the weighing the equities of the matter. My learned friend is speaking as if his application would automatically be upheld at the end of the day. I as to the merits or otherwise of it, I make no comment. But as to the interim, I believe that the Supreme Court was very right in reaching the conclusion that it reached that weighing the issue on a scale, it is better for the, the, the interim applicant to be dismissed and right. then for the Supreme Court to go into the substantive matter. Okay. How to I mean, fast track that matter will be left to my learned friend and all the other parties in the matter. That's all that I need to say. Thank yes. you, Hoku Painto. Uh, Roxanne, some 20 seconds. What are your final thoughts? That I, 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 I pray and hope that this matter will be expeditiously determined as already prayed by a party in the matter. And, and I hope that um, uh, we all learn uh, from what happened yesterday that we, we need to do the proper thing all the time. If I'm properly served, I will be in court. I don't see a court. I All go right. to court every time. Thank you. And uh, so the politics that I refuse to go to court, it's a big lie. Right. Uh, 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 th this this final point, though, very quickly. So it means Parliament will now have to hear, uh, sit, you know, on, on at, those, vet those people not, and then proceed, right? Parliament, Parliament, Parliament is not enjoined to do that. Oh, I see. Parliament can still say that pending the determination of the, of the, of the matter on its merit, it won't proceed. It is the right of Parliament to say so. So Parliament is basically going to sidestep or ignore the ruling of the court. That's what you're but saying. Parliament, the, the ruling, the ruling didn't direct Parliament at all. The ruling didn't but it points to your ruling. application in court on which basis the Speaker made that decision. Yes, but, but there's also a prayer, there's also a prayer for perpetual injunction with my relief.
it's a prayer for perpetual injunction. All right, which is which is yeah. which is yet to be granted. But thank you, thank you uh, for joining the thank conversation. Uh, Roxanne Nelson, Daphia McCoy is uh, the legislator for South Dye. He's been in the thick of things on this going to the Supreme Court. And uh, we also had Kweku Painto, a lawyer. Stay with us. There's still more to come.